Good morning and welcome to the uh, service at St James Anglican Church, Menangle. We do give you a warm welcome and trust that you'll enjoy your service time with us. Uh, we do give a special welcome to our guest preacher, Gary Dibley, uh, from CMS, who will talk to us later. Prior to uh, starting the service, we'll just have a couple of um, passages from the Bible. One from Revelation. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and power and honour, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Another one from Daniel. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness. Though we have rebelled against him and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord, our God, by following his laws, which he set before us. We shall start the service with hymn number 170, actually, in the blue book, but you probably don't have your blue books, so it'll be on... It's at the name of Jesus. This hymn proclaims the sovereignty of Jesus. So let's sing this hymn together. I'll now ask Gary to come up and uh, spend a few minutes just letting us know. Welcome. Thank you. It's good to be here. And tell us a little bit about yourself and your working life with CMS and sure. etc. Uh, so I, I attend uh, Norellan Anglican Church uh, up the road, obviously. Uh, we've been out there about five years. Uh, I work for CMS on the missions operations director there, so I've been there uh, about five and a half years or so. My role is really caring for missionaries when they come uh, back to Australia, back to Sydney on, on home assignment and uh, looking after a lot to do with summer school and all the jobs that really no one else wants to do. <laughs> that sums it all up, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. The word operations. So you've been there five years. What drew you to CMS? Uh, I've always been a supporter of CMS. I've, I love what they do and I love what they do even more now after being involved uh, in the organisation. Uh, I, I was a system minister before that time and uh, I needed to find something else and uh, in God's timing, everything just fell into place for that role to, to, to come and uh, I've enjoyed uh, every minute of it. Married with children? Yes, married with children, uh, three grown-up children, um, seven grandchildren, another one on the way. So mm. and they, they all live sort of locally and my one of my sons just works down the road at Broughton, Anglican, so... Yeah, we're pretty local now, so it's nice. Oh, well, it's good to yeah. have you. Good to have you here uh, to uh, preach to us, and we look forward to the word. Thank you. Look forward to it too. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Gary. We shall say this prayer of praise together. Together. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. 
For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. You are worthy, Lamb of God, for you were slain. And with your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honour and glory and power for ever and ever. Amen. We will now have our readings and prior to the readings, let us say this prayer together. Thank you, Father, that all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness. Open our hearts to receive your word that we may know you better and be thoroughly equipped for every good work through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The first reading will be from Psalm 65. Praise is due to you, O God in Zion, and to you shall vows be performed. O you who hear prayer, to you shall all flesh, all flesh come. When iniquities prevail against you, you atone for our transgressions. Blessed is the one who chose, who choose and bring near to dwell in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of, at your house, the holiness of your temple. By awesome deeds you answer us with righteousness, O God of our salvation, the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas, the one who by his strength established the mountains, being girded with might, who stills the roaring of the seas, the roarings of the waves, the tumult of the peoples, so that those who dwell at the ends of the earth are in awe at your signs. You make the going out of the morning and the evening to shout for joy. You visit the earth and water it. You greatly enrich it. The river of God is full of water. You provide their grain, for so you have prepared it. You water its furrows abundantly, settling its ridges, softening it with showers and blessing its growth. You crown the year with your bounty. Your wagon tracks overflow with abundance. The pastures of the wilderness overflow. The hills gird themselves with joy. The meadows clothe themselves with flocks. The valleys dex, dex themselves with grain. They shout and sing together with joy. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I ask Beverly to come and give us our New Testament reading, please. The reading comes from Acts chapter 14. Now Paul and Barnabas, when they entered together into the Jewish synagogue, they spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their mind against the brothers. So they remained for a long time speaking boldly for the Lord, who bore witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews and some with the apostles. When an attempt was made by both Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to mistreat them and to stone them, they learned of it and fled to Lystra and Derby, cities of Lyconia, and to the surrounding country, and they were continued and they continued to preach the gospel. Now at Lystra there was a man sitting who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul speaking, and Paul, looking intently at him, and seeing that he had faith to be made well, said in a loud voice, Stand upright on your feet. And he sprang up and began walking. And when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in Lyconian, The gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. 
Barnabas they called Zeus and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. And the priest of Zeus, whose temple was at the entrance to the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their garments and rushed out into the crowd, crying out, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men of like nature with you, and we bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In past generations, he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways. Yet he did not leave himself without witness, for he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Even with these words, they scarcely restrained the people from offering sacrifices to them. But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. But when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and entered the city, and on the next day he went with Barnabas to Derbe. When they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Then they passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia. And when they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Atalia. And from there they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work that they had fulfilled. And when they arrived and gathered the church together, they declared all that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles and they remained no little time with the disciples. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Lord. And now the Lord's Prayer, is that right? No? Okay, thank you. We've reached that part of our service where we'll be uh, uh, inviting Gary to come and uh, preach, preach us from the word. Thank you, Gary. Well, it's certainly a great privilege to be here today and to open God's words with you and thank you for the welcome, uh, Daryl. It is great to be here and as Daryl said, I do work with CMS. Uh, I've sort of got two hats on. I've come from Narell and Anglican as we're helping you out through this time and I've also come with my CMS hat on as well. Uh, one of the great privileges of being in a church, obviously, is partnering with those that you send. And I want to thank you for the partnerships that you've had with uh, Robin and Jeff, uh, who went to Malta uh, many years ago, and their children. I know that they, they finished up earlier this year, and they thank you for your partnership with them. And I want to thank you as well, and thank you for your, your generous prayers and your financial support of them. I do want to give you a brief update from Jeff and Robin there. Uh, up on the central coast, Jeff is an assistant minister now in the Lakes area, uh, but I, uh, I ask you to pray for them. It's a, it's a very tough transition when missionaries come back and then go into a local ministry. So I pray that, um, well, I, I encourage you to keep praying for them and they would love you to pray for them as well. And I'd love too, in time, uh, once you get a new minister, that you will once again be uh, partnered with us in mission as we hope to see a world that knows Jesus. And so that would be a, a very good thing to do uh, in the future. Uh, before us today, with th that passage that was read to us from Bev Acts chapter 14, uh, is the second part of Paul's first missionary journey. It covers a lot of ground. Uh, it'd be good if you have Acts chapter 14 in front of you. But before we look at it, let me pray. 
Uh, Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the opportunity we have to open your word. We thank you that you're a speaking God, that you haven't left us by ourselves, uh, that we can come to know you by opening your word and having you speak. And we do pray this morning as we look at uh, this missionary journey of Paul and Barnabas and how your word went out from Jerusalem, we do pray, Father, that we'll be people who want the word to go out from here. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in chapter 13, we see the first part of this missionary journey of Paul and Barnabas. Uh, they're at Antioch, and, which is right on the border of Syria and Turkey. Uh, they then go to the island of Cyprus, uh, which is, uh, and then they go up to the mainland of Turkey, up to another Antioch, and then we find them today in Iconium. And this is all in what we would call today's Turkey. And they find themselves in this Antioch because they've been expelled from the last place they were at. They were expelled because the Jews had incited persecution against them. They incited persecution against them because they were preaching the gospel to the Gentiles after they, the Jews, had rejected their, mission, their, their message. I want to bring four points to us this morning. They all regard mission. And the first one will be that mission brings opposition. If you've got your Bibles open, Acts chapter 14, let me read from verse 1. Now at Iconium they entered together into the Jewish synagogue and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. But the unbelieving Jews stood up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So they remained for a long time, speaking boldly for the Lord, who bore witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews and some with the apostles. And when an attempt was made by both Jews and uh, Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to mistreat them and to stone them, they learned of it and fled to Lystra and, Dar and Derby, cities of Lyconia, and to the surrounding country. And there they continued to preach the gospel. The first point, let me say it again, mission brings opposition. We already know this from chapter 13, and that's why Paul and Barnabas are now here in Iconium. But opposition doesn't mean that mission stops. It sometimes happens elsewhere. Especially in these circumstances we find ourselves in in chapter 14, when the, when the gospel is first going out from Jerusalem. And as the gospel starts to go to the nations through the book of Acts, it always goes to the Jews first. Here in Iconium, we see in verse 1 that a great number of Jews and Gentiles believed. But alas, in verse 2, the unbelieving Jews try to stir up trouble. See, just as in the gospel, the good news is not always well received. Yet this opposition has compelled Paul and Barnabas, it says in verse 3, to stay a long time. And speak boldly. Well, why might this be? Well, I think we know from the last verse of chapter 13, as they were driven out of Pisidian Antioch, verse 52 says that the disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit. They're not doing it on their own. Now, one of the, one of the distinctives of CMS is doing mission long term. Jeff and Robin were in Malta long term. Uh, when we say long term, we say six years at least. We intend to send our missionaries long term because we believe that the longer a missionary is there, the more they understand the, the culture, they learn the language, they put deep roots down. But therefore also, you can imagine then the longer they are there, the harder it is to come back. Australia is no longer their home. They find it difficult to adapt Australia is often doesn't feel like their home any longer. Well, our mission, of course, is much different to Paul and Barnabas. They had good reason to stay a long time where they were, but then leave. It's a different model to what we, uh, what we see now and what is required. But when they get to Lystra, we have this account of this crippled man, this man who was crippled from birth. Paul sees that he has faith to be healed 
and at once the man stands up. Now, this is no partial miracle. It wasn't a, let me rub your legs a bit, then here's the number of a friend of mine who's a good physio and maybe we'll get a, a frame for you and then we'll get you in the pool and you can swim and then slowly and in probably a year you might be able to walk. No, this man had never ever walked. His brain had never had the opportunity to tell his legs to walk. His tendons and muscles and ligaments had never grown. And yet, here... In an instant, he is healed. He is able to walk. And we see that the locals who witnessed this understood the enormity of this event. Let's read from verse, 13, uh, from verse 11. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in the Lyconian language, the gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes because... He was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought bulls and wreaths to the city gates because he and the crowd wanted to offer sacrifices to them. We can see that the, what the locals did was they saw this great miracle and they applied their theology to it. It's called contextualisation. It's applying something to the context that you're in. And this is another reason for having missionaries long-term, to understand the context of their location and people. Point number two is this, that mission needs to be explained. You see, it's not easy for many people across the world the fa whose foundation of the laws is not based on the Bible as ours are. There are many terms that we use that are just part of our vernacular. For instance, we call people, some people, a doubting Thomas. We know what we're talking about. We might call an idyllic place Eden. Or when we talk of an underdog victory, we talk in terms of David and Goliath. But if you haven't been brought up in our culture, you have no idea what we were talking about. And so as Paul and Barnabas show these people the power of God to do the miraculous, they need to explain to them what has just happened. See, so the locals assume straight away that it is their gods who have done something miraculous. Paul and Barnabas must now explain to them that it wasn't their gods at all. And I want you to notice from verse 14 very closely what happens here. Let me read from verse 14. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their garments and rushed out into the crowd, crying out, Men, why are you doing these things? We are also men of like nature with you, and we bring you good news, that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. In past generations... He allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways. Yet he did not leave himself without witness. For he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. And even with these words, they scarcely, they scarcely restrained the people from offering sacrifice to them. I wonder what you notice about how they explain God to these people. Interestingly, they didn't tell them anything about Jesus. They didn't say anything about the cross. They didn't say anything about forgiveness. They didn't talk about resurrection. And there is a reason why Luke has recorded this for us. In all the other accounts before this, we've had the gospel being preached and we've always heard about the forgiveness of sins. We've heard about the repentance. We've heard about the cross. We've heard about the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. But here there is no mention. And friends, it's because for these people it would be too much too soon. Paul and Barnabas cut it right back to the basics. You know the rain that comes and waters your crops? That's from our God. You have plenty of food and your hearts are joyful. That too is from our God. 
He does that for the whole earth. And we're here to tell you about him. See, mission is about explaining the gospel in a way that others will understand. It's not your chance to explain how much you know. You tell it in a way that people are going to understand. See, again, the way Paul and Barnabas do mission is not how we're able to do it today. And this is why we focus on in-depth training with CMS. Not only do we require that all our missionaries have done at least one year of theological training, but we send them to intensive missional training in our training facility down in Melbourne, St Andrews Hall. They stay there for five months learning culture and how theology works across the world. Many throughout the world are very religious but very far from God. This was the problem with the people from Iconium. They needed mission to be explained to them in a way that they could understand. They needed to be pointed in the right direction by having this gospel explained. Let's go to verse 19. But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. But when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and entered the city and on the next day he went on with Barnabas to Derby. Point number three is this. Mission is sometimes dangerous. Paul and Barnabas knew it, but we find it hard to believe. Friends, one in eight Christians in the world today are persecuted for their faith. One in eight. Now, statistics don't tell the full story because if you took all the Christians who are out in the, West, in the Western world out of that equation, that statistic would be a lot worse. You see, people are going to be upset when you talk about the truth of sin, the truth of being far from God, the truth of being reminded of a need for forgiveness, the truth of Jesus being the only way to God. That is offensive to so many. See, when you find people who are zealous about their religion and you tell them a different narrative to the way that their worldview has brought them up and everything they have grown to believe and you tell them that that is wrong, there is bound to be tension. We see it in the Gospels. The Jews put Jesus on the cross. And here they are trying to do exactly the same thing. They want the message of Jesus destroyed. Now, we are sometimes surprised when people don't thank us for sharing the gospel with them. We bring the good news to people and often people just reject it. They don't want to hear that sin is a hold of them and they were meant to be living a different kind of life. Please be a church that prays for the gospel to change people's hearts so that they will respond to the good news of Jesus. And when it comes to persecution, most organisations who are in that field say that the prayer of the persecuted is not necessarily that the persecution stops, but rather that they would uphold, they would be held in strong faith through that persecution. See, friends, persecution is actually inevitable if you're a believer. How should we react when people refuse to listen to us or ridicule us? Well, let's see what Paul and Barnabas do. Verse 21. When they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church, with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Paul and Barnabas kept it up. They didn't stop. They understood that mission was dangerous, but it was essential. They wanted to keep on going because they knew there was no other way for people to be saved and come into a right relationship with God than other than having the gospel preached to them. They knew what was at stake. 
and they had God's spirit in them driving them. They knew there will come a day when every person will stand before God and give an account of their life. And they made sure in verse 23 that the church had good leadership structure in. Now when CMS sends missionaries, they do not intend them to take the place of the local person doing the leadership. They don't want to run the church. It's much better done by a local person, someone who is suitably trained and equipped. We don't send missionaries to take over or to import Western culture into theirs, but we help train them so they know how to run a church well with good biblical theology. Well, let's go to the last part of our passage from verse 24. Then they passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia. And when they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Atalia. And from there they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work that they had fulfilled. And when they arrived and gathered the church together, they declared all that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And they remained no little time with the disciples. Point number four about mission is this. Mission needs supporters. Back at the start of chapter 13, we saw the church in Antioch send Paul and Barnabas out to do the work of proclaiming the gospel. Paul and Barnabas thought it only right and fitting to go back then to Antioch to those people who supported them and who had been praying for them, to give them a report of what God's been doing. And so you too here have been the beneficiary of that as missionaries come back and tell you what God is doing in other parts of the world. They come to you because you have been their supporters. And you've been reminded that if no one sent anybody, no one would go. You see, mission involves everyone. Nobody is left out. Not all can go, but some can. All can pray. Most can care. Most can give. See, God has been opening doors just as he did for Paul and Barnabas ever since. And can I please encourage you to continue to be on board with what God is doing all around us and all over the world. And you can imagine that it's difficult to cross cultures with the gospel. And it's even more difficult at the moment as we have missions, missionaries waiting to leave who actually can't go anywhere and missionaries who are trying to get back to Australia but are finding it very difficult. We've been in, uh, we have many missionaries who have been in severe lockdown for well over 12 months. And friends, my missionaries tell me that what we have here is not a lockdown. They have been stuck in small units, hardly ever being able to get outside at all. So just imagine that there was few or no one supporting them through this time. Just imagine that there was few or none sending emails or praying for them or supporting them financially. We do not want that to happen and I'm sure you don't want that to happen either. So can I encourage you to continue to play your part in praying, in caring, in giving and even perhaps going I encourage you to go to the CMS website, check it out, have a look at it, search around. It's not that hard. You can get onto prayer lists. You can find out how to give. You can even find out how you might be able to ask questions about how to go. But friends, mission is for all of us. We're to be all involved. And it's such a privilege that God gives us. So don't let that go. Let me pray. Now, Father God, we do thank you that the good news of Jesus is for the whole world. And we thank you that you've entrusted to us, feeble as we are, sinful as we are. Father, we, might, we pray that we might take up the challenges that you give us, to pray, to care, to give and to go, that we might have a world that knows Jesus. And we pray this in his name. Amen.
Thank you, Gary, for uh, bringing that message. Uh, interesting how when you follow the Acts of the Apostles and what CMS do, there's uh, very much a strong link there. Thank you for bringing that out to us. We will now have our second song, This Life I Live, which will be provided to us by Andrew. Thank you. We're now at that part of our service where we will say the Apostles' Creed together. Together, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. Just a prayer. Although we are people of God, Scripture reminds us that we still sin. We need to confess our failures, knowing that the Lord Jesus died for us and intercedes for us with the Father. Let us now draw near to God, who freely forgives through his infinite goodness and mercy, and pray to him with sincerity and confidence. We'll say this together. 
Heavenly Father, we praise you for adopting us as your children and making us heirs of eternal life. In your mercy, you have washed us from our sins and made us clean in your sight. Yet we still fail to love you and serve you as we should. Forgive us our sins and renew us by your grace that we may continue to grow as members of Christ in whom alone is our salvation. Amen. God is slow to anger and full of compassion. He forgives all who humbly repent and turn to his son Jesus Christ in whom there is no condemnation. Amen. I now invite Bev to come and provide us with our prayers. Beginning with Psalm 34. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Our Father God, we thank you that we can come into your presence and know that you hear and answer prayer. We praise you for our creation, preservation and all the blessings of this life. Thank you that you care for humanity and that you desire relationship with people everywhere. And Lord, as we think of our world, we think of CMS and the work that missionaries are doing throughout the world. They are serving you and making disciples. We ask you to bless the work of CMS both overseas and in Australia. And we thank you that CMS also works with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders' work in this country. Be with our world in the COVID situation. We just pray that we know that you've got your hand on the world at all times and the situations and we pray from our human perspective that this um, COVID virus might be taken from our world very soon and that people will see that you are in control. We pray for our nation, we pray for Sydney in particular, that people might abide by the rules and that um, we will be taken out of this pandemic. Lord, for our church here we pray. We thank you that we can worship freely and we just ask that you will be with our leaders here at the moment. Be with those who are seeking a new minister. That um, in your time, Lord, a minister may be found. And we just thank you for the faithful teaching of the Bible in Menangle. Lord, many of our number are sick and we particularly pray for Diane Siddons who is facing surgery and we pray for Celeste and for her improvement. Lord, give strength and enablement to the sick as they trust you. We thank you that we have a living God and that we have your spirit within us to give us the words to speak to others of your love and the fact that we can have eternal life. Thank you for the challenge that was brought to us in the sermon to speak the word in a, a manner that people will understand too. We ask you to accept our prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. We will now say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. 
Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. As we draw the service to a close, we do have one final hymn, Thine Be the Glory. May the hope, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Just in concluding, we need to look forward to um, having a continuation of our lockdown for at least another week. Um, so, and... Also, a notice that uh, Bible study, Wednesday night Bible study is resuming. Uh, Peter Riley did send out an invitation to people who, who wish to work harder on uh, understanding their Bible, that we do have a Wednesday night Bible study that at the moment is on Zoom. So please follow that up as we all need to uh, keep up our, our strength in, in our Christian belief. Uh, another reminder that around 11 o'clock, once this service concludes, there will be a Zoom link opening which will allow you to uh, feel like you're in the stables, which are not. You'll still be in your own lounge room. Um, but it will give you the opportunity to see other people, meet them, 
again, have a chat uh, at, at whatever time you like and uh, at your leisure. So the Zoom meeting is also found on the website. Now, the, now we'll say the grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Thank you very much.